if one were to tell an unborn child that outside the womb, there's a glorious world with green fields and lush gardens, high mountains and vast seas, with a sky lit by the sun and the moon, the unborn would not believe such absurdity. Still in the dark womb, how could he imagine the indescribable majesty of this world? In the same way, when the mystics speak of worlds beyond scent and color, the common man, deafened by greed and blinded by self-interest, cannot grasp the reality. From Rumi's Little Book of Life, The Garden of the Soul, The Heart, The Spirit. My guest today is Holly McKay, a foreign policy expert and war crimes investigator. McKay has worked on the front lines of several major war zones and covered the humanitarian and diplomatic crises in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria, Iran, Turkey, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Burma, Russia, Africa, Latin America, and other areas. Her most recent work is the Amazon bestseller, Only Cry for the Living, Memos from Inside the ISIS Battlefield, uh, where she basically offers a raw chronological construction through her memos of the historical impact of ISIS across Iraq and Syria, as seen through the eyes of sex slaves, internally displaced people, persecuted minorities, humanitarian workers, relig uh, religious leaders, military commanders, and even the terrorists themselves in certain parts. Joins us now from Afghanistan is the one and only Holly McKay. Welcome, Holly. Hi, thanks for having me. You're welcome. <laughs> so how has your day been? It's been, uh, it's been busy. I'm in Kabul at the moment, so uh, never a dull moment in Afghanistan, that's for sure. Right, so let's go back a little bit. How was yeah. your, like briefly, how was your upbringing and how did that, do you think that affected you? So I was born and raised in Australia and in small country towns and I got very into ballet at a young age and something that I wanted to do professionally and really that um, it, may, it may seem worlds away from war reporting, but that's really what I think piqued my interest for the world because we really learned so much about different cultures and different music and different arts. And uh, I sort of just have this insatiable appetite to travel. I ended up breaking my ankle when I was 18. And so I went to university to study and, and got pretty restless. And I went to do my last semester in New York. Um, and sort of from there, that's how I got an internship at a news organization. And uh, they offered to sponsor me after that. I was very young. I was ju I just turned 21. So it was this sort of crazy kind of baptism by fire into the journalism arena. And I was based in Los Angeles for a while and really doing general assignment. And then I started to travel a lot. And I just, yeah, I just felt that there was so much more that I could be doing with my with my writing, with my career. And I really wanted to tell those human stories. So I think after sort of my first couple of conflict zones, it sort of becomes quite addictive and you really can't, you can't see yourself doing anything else. And that was really, for me, I just, that was all, and you know, really still is all that I have wanted to do. So it's, it's been, been a real privilege to be able to visit different countries and kind of ingratiate myself into people's lives in a in a very intimate way. Mm. And when was the first time you visited the Middle East? Uh, my first trip to the Middle East um, was just as a tourist and that was in 2010 um, but the first time I actually worked uh, was 2014. Mm. And when was the first time in 2010? That was 2014. That was the uh, Israel and, and um, Gaza conflict and Palestinian conflict. So that was sort of, I was there really doing a research assignment really in Jordan at the time. And that sort of erupted very quickly that summer. And so I sort of went back and, and tried to sort of piece what I could from both sides. So that's when you decided to, to stay? Yes, that's really when I decided that that was solely what I wanted to do with my career, that I didn't want to be sort of flip-flopping and, and I really wanted to focus on the foreign aspect and really the human aspect. That's what interested me most. Um, I definitely have an interest in the military side. I, I find that interesting, but but even more interesting than you know what we call the bang bang is really just those human stories and you just really meet just the most extraordinary people and their sense of uh, resilience and how they're able to survive really the most unfathomable circumstances. I just felt that these very ordinary people had such extraordinary tales and, and that's really how to, to bring that back to audiences in America and to sort of be not a voice for them because they have their own voice, but to be a vessel and, and they're looking 
people are just that's a sense of justice to people is to to be able to tell their story even though they know deep down they'll never see any justice of what was done to them um, you know by government troops or by terrorists or by whoever it may be but to be able to tell their story and and for the world to sort of have an understanding of what they've gone through that to them is a sense of justice and that's where I sort of see my role as a writer. So you could say that the trigger to where you are in life right now was these what happened in 2014 when you were covering the Israeli Palestine the Gaza war so you, yes and then and that's the only time I covered that particular conflict was then and then after that around that time that was when um ISIS had just come into Mosul so hmm you know, just sort of seen this very uh, cataclysmic thing and, and everything was happening in Syria and, you know, you still sort of had all these after effects of the Arab Spring and I just, you know, the, it was just this sort of trove of, of things that felt so far removed from my life in America and yet I felt that they really affected America and they really affected the world and they needed to be told and, and you need to, you know, I'm a sort of person that really needs to be on the ground to tell these stories. I can't, my, I can't sit at my desk. I can't scroll through Twitter. I have to, I have to be there. And, and, and there really is a place for, you know, what we call bearing witness. And I, you know, and, and it's sad to me now, sort of what I see a lot in this sort of social media generation and also just with the news corporations really just focused on the bottom line and not really wanting to invest that kind of money and sending journalists to these places. And I think that's really sad because you'll never really understand the full depth of conflict um, if you aren't there. And so, yeah, I see that as, as being extremely pivotal on so many different levels. Hmm. And let's go back a little bit. You wrote in the book, in the introduction, you wrote that, there was this scene from the um, the first Gulf War where mm -hmm. you saw I, I read the excerpt but mm -hmm. so <clears throat> as we journeyed to, to Jerusalem that day I thought about myself as a little girl I remembered one afternoon dancing around the living room at two Madonna and unexpectedly catching sight of footage of the Gulf War on television I remember with clarity being shocked and appalled as hollow buildings, as hollowed buildings burned and children just like me ran unaccompanied for their lives. There was a flashing image of one little girl who looked my age, covered in blood and wailing, the foot of an armed soldier beside her. I couldn't understand how in 1991, given the modern and magical world my six-year-old self thought we lived in, that it was possible for there to be war anywhere. I had been raised to believe that war was a bygone concept. After learning my grandfather fought in World War II in some era lifetimes before I was born, I had simply thought that the world had learned its lesson and there was no way people needed to orchestrate mass killings anymore. I was conv convinced that surely everyone valued life and talked through their problems. So was that, the, did that mm -hmm. contribute to your decision? Mm, absolutely. And I, I, you know, it's funny, the, the memories that you have as a child that really stick with you, but that definitely, you know, growing up in a very sort of idyllic place and, you know, Australia is sort of one of the few countries in the world that's never actually fought a war on its soil or, or had to sort of contend with that. So we learned a lot about war in school and we learned about, you know, we have Anzac Day, we have Memorial, you know, Remembrance Day, which is our equivalent of Memorial Day. And so, you know, you learn about the history of war and, and, and it's a very intimate sense for my family. But at the same time, I, um, yeah, it would just it was so unfathomable to me to, to, to think that that level of violence still continues to some degree. And I, yeah, I just, I couldn't understand it. And even now as, a, as a, an adult that's been doing this a long time, I still, I still sometimes struggle to wrap my head around how anything good can ever come out of such sort of brutality and mass killing. And I have another question, but it, it's kind of complicated. So I hope you, you're going to understand what I'm asking. So I've had an incident on the 28th of January, 2020, where I felt like I was humiliated. And I, after that incident, multiple definitions I had you know, were, were altered, and one of which was being human. Like after that certain incident, 
of course it was building up but after that specific incident i felt like you know i, I i'm more animal than i am human if you, if you get my point but then again like a year after that or not a year a couple of months i received your book i started reading and as i read these stories of people that have lost their their loved ones have, that have lost their um, their limbs that are suffering you know from disease that's unidentifiable i felt like my experience or what i what i experienced is it's too trivial because it was you know political it was a case of political uh, oppression so i wanted to ask you how do you draw that thin line between I, being um, human and being you know mm, animal I, mm. you know it sounds very weird but i think you you got my no point. i understand absolutely and i think you know regardless of you know whether you're you're dealing with a lost limb or a lost loved one or you're dealing with a sense of injustice in your own way and we all have our own things that upset us and and we have our own you know and i would never i would never take that and i think that people shouldn't um you know shouldn't sort of self take away from from what they're going through either so you know we all have different uh you know things that we experience but certainly i think you know humans are animals we are you know we are human sapiens we are um you know we're all just we just happen to be able to sort of have rational and irrational brains i think um you know and i think that that's sort of what differentiates us from from most other animals on the planet but you know at the end of the day we do have that very primordial instinct of of just wanting to feel um you know sort of a, a sense of, of internal rage or, or or sort of losing control of of what our emotions are and i think that's all very normal and i think you'd be hard pressed to find anybody on the planet that hasn't sort of had those moments um, and they always, you know, they affect us in different ways. And I think it's important to learn from them. Um, it's important to recognize what that trigger was. And you, it, often, often it's not the, the circumstance itself. I think that that upsets us, it comes from a, a different place. It comes from, a, you know, a much broader trauma or a much broader sort of experience. And I think, you know, when those moments happen, at least for me, and they certainly do happen, you know, especially when I am working abroad and often in, in challenging circumstances. And, and once I've been able to calm down, I, you know, I really do try to go in and, and reflect and, and figure out where that behavior came from and how I can perhaps learn to better handle that next time such a situation arises or you know avoid that trigger altogether in whatever the circumstance may be so I think um yeah you know having that self-awareness is something that it's a constant struggle but it's something I'm always trying to do and I'm always trying to sort of encourage other people to not just to let the moment pass but also understand where that moment came from mm. great and the, the second thing I have to to tell you it's it's kind of uh, 180 degrees away from that um so you've, you've covered multiple conflicts and you've been to many war torn countries. Um, do, do you recall like instances of jokes, like humor? How is humor at war through your, your experience? Absolutely. And I think to a degree, <laughs> You have to have humor. You mean, you know, you can't, um, you know, you get a bunch of journalists or, or NGO workers or whoever it may be, certainly military people in a, in a room together and there'll be lots of, you know, terrible jokes that if they ever leaked, you know, to the press, you'd be absolutely um, taken over the coals. But humor is only, you know, is a way to get through that. And, um, you know, we have we have to make we have to make jokes constantly um and that's sort of a it's a survival mechanism that we have and and yeah often you know yeah as i said people would probably look at the jokes and think that they're a lot of the time extremely inappropriate and often they are but in the moment it's that sense of relief that you can can sometimes you, you, we can't take ourselves seriously 100 percent of the time even in a very serious situation and so having um, you know, being able to look at yourself in a, with a little bit of brevity, I think, is, is keeps us sane. It's it's the modality that that if, enables me to continue doing this work at times. So, um, yeah, there certainly is some, some some dark humor that comes into it, but um, yeah, that's that's a I think it's a sanity preservation. And you will often find with a lot of the people that you're interviewing, they also have that same sense of of dark humor or being able to poke fun at a really horrendous situation that they're in. And I think that's a that's a real sign of of um, a coping mechanism, really. And at certain points when you were in the field 
were there certain moments that you felt like you know this was it i'm i'm i might die any moment do, do you have these thoughts um, certainly have those thoughts i think that sorry i have something on my lip um i think we have those thoughts but i think um i never let them get in the way of what i am focused on i think um, in those situations, uh, you tend to just kind of go into that flight or flight mode where you're in that really sort of response mode and whatever that survival instinct really kicks in and you don't have a lot of time to think about yourself or think about, um, you know, a a anything broader. But I think, you know, for me, I don't really let myself go down that path. I really try to trust my judgment, trust my instinct and, um, and get myself out of that situation if it is something that I think is 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 very dangerous. And I've certainly, um, you know, been been very fortunate to to have those instincts. I know it sounds bizarre, but you really do rely so much on those instincts. Um, whether that's timing, whether that's just sensing that a situation is something is going to happen, and sometimes there's no real rhyme or reason to it. Um, it's just an instinct that you have, and I I definitely follow that, and they're definitely. Um, you really sharpen that the more that you spend, um, you know, in hostile areas. So I think that's really been something that saved me in, in many times. And I, um, I, you know, I try to follow it as best I can. Mm. And prior to coming to the Middle East, especially uh, Iraq and Syria and covering the ISIS occupation, um, did you have any stereotypes in mind before coming? And then when you came, you had you completely changed your mind and thought, you know, how did I reach this conclusion and so forth? Did something similar happen? Right. Um, I think they happen in small moments. I think that, um, you know, with that, that particular conflict, I think that, you know, just sort of looking at it from a US lens, for example, you tend to think that, okay, well, everything must be motivated by this sort of extremist uh, ideology. But often what I found on the ground was that, um, sure, you know, that sort of religious extremist was a factor, but it certainly wasn't the factor. There were so many other nuances that came and, and so many other reasons that people had joined the dash. And usually it really came down to economy or it came down to something as simple as the, the dash took over the hospital that you were working in. So, you know, you still need to feed your family at home. So suddenly you have a new boss. Um, and, it, you know, it wasn't quite looked at as being... Um, you know, you're joining out of some sort of um, great motivation to be part of a caliphate. It was really just a pure survival instinct that people had. And I, I found that that, you know, really was the, the sort of the central reason that people joined. And, and then also um, with corruption, with government corruption and, and feeling oppressed and feeling like your own government, the people that are supposed to look after you, uh, the ones that are oppressing you and, and, and not enabling you to get a proper job or a proper education or so many things. And so when somebody comes to you and says, look, we're gonna take, a, take this government out, we're gonna fight them. And you have that sense of anger, you know, that's another huge reason of why people, people get up and join. So I think um, we tend to sort of look at it in the US as very black and white as, you know, people joining for very ideological reasons, but, you know, and certainly there are many that do join for those ideological reasons, but quite often um, there are so many other factors of, of why people feel the need to join these groups. And I think until we're sort of willing to acknowledge that and willing to look at the root causes of that, um, we are going to continue continue to deal with the same problem and never really address um, the fundamentals of it. Mm. And in late uh, 2010 and early 2011, you know, when the Arab Spring was just, you know, unfolding, were you at the time keeping up with the news and following up with what was, what was happening at the time? And did you think it, it would end up like this? Uh, well, I mean, you know, at the time it was, it was, just, it was very mesmerizing. I mean, you know, and I sort of had had a lot of hope for, for people that were were standing up to those things. And, and, and you know, and I say that and because, you know, I've always had the, you know, the privilege of being able to live, you know, under relative, um, you know, relative sort of, uh, you know, it's a shattered word, but democracy and, and being able to, um, you know, you know, have a sort of a sense of equality in the life that I was growing up in. And I, you know, and I, I want that for everybody. And so to sort of see people just 
stand up and demand their rights and and you know want a better life I, you know that certainly gave me a lot of hope but I guess the retaliation for that and the um you know if you look at Syria the, the sort of the response to that in a war that is still going on um many years later and that is that is heartbreaking because you know so many people who who really went out on a limb you know were the ones that suffered and and then you know within that um and we see this so often as well is that a lot of the opposition groups then tend to get hijacked by you know very extremist groups you know the dash itself um really sort of hijacked this opposition movement in Syria and you sort of saw a big sort of offshoot there and so you know then that really damages sort of the cause of the the opposition groups as well so it, it ended up becoming a, a no-win situation for for everybody really and you know that and it's heartbreaking because in countries like that there really isn't I mean what viable alternative do you have in taking out a government if you can't have a legitimate election I mean you can't have a legitimate say and you know peaceful protesting in the street is you know as an American that's something that is our as our constitutional right and you know and, and I, I really feel for people that 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 want a better life, that are, very, are faced with, with very few options in, in being able to achieve that. And I think because generally speaking, you know, the outcomes from the Arab Spring in, in most countries were quite dismal. Um, how many years is it going to be until, you know, people sort of have that same um, bravery and, and, and willingness to, to sort of stand up to the powers to be? So I think there, there are gonna be another wave like the Arab Spring? It's always hard to predict these things. I think certainly when people are angry, when people are hungry, when people, um, you know, are fed up, um, they will they will convalesce. And and but but at to what degree, you know, what power do they really have in in being able to stand up to very well armed governments um, without sort of just walking into a hail of bullets and and being you know faced with slaughter? And I think that. People going to look at the lessons of the past, and and I know with a lot of Syrians, they obviously feel very abandoned um, in the political decisions that were made from the international community. So, mm. you know, right now I certainly don't don't sort of see that happening. But but again, these things are also very extremely unpredictable. So you never say never. Mm. And do you see ISIS or any similar Islamic um, group making a comeback? Well, ISIS certainly is still, you know, launching mm -hmm. daily attacks across Iraq and Syria, especially in that border area. And so, you know, any, you know, they may have been defeated territorially, but they certainly are a group that exists and that has multiple affiliates really around the world. And, and here in Afghanistan, ISIS-K is something to really be concerned about. It's a growing, um, it's a growing group. Um, I've actually interviewed some of the fighters that are sort of out in hiding and, they're very strong ideologically. They, you know, very set on their goals, and I think that it's going to be, you know, what we're seeing here in Afghanistan almost daily attacks um, since the Taliban took power in August. And you know, the Taliban wants to deny that it really exists, but but it, it's a it's a big problem. And 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 sort of the difference, I guess, with the Taliban and, and ISIS is Taliban's really is focused purely in, on its nationalistic goals. It doesn't have um, itself doesn't have goals to you know launch any attacks outside of its borders. But ISIS sort of doesn't doesn't recognize, doesn't acknowledge, uh, doesn't accept these borders. So therefore their goals are a lot more broader. And I do think, um, you know, maybe not immediately, but I do think, you know, it is a cause for concern. And I certainly think um, that because of the attention that ISIS-K is able to sort of get, um, it certainly will attract those foreign recruits and, and attract, you know, ISIS fighters from the Middle East and already has, um, you know, that sort of see Afghanistan as the new power hub. And, and it is something that I think is, is very concerning. Mm. And towards the end of your book, there was, um, there was a chapter on how, the, um, how Iraq was dealing with uh, the ISIS brides and ISIS children, children that were, some of them were even mm -hmm. born and lived most of their lives or all of their lives under ISIS. And this takes us back to the quote from Rumi included in the, in the introduction. Do you think it, it, it would actually be possible to kind of um, change these uh, children's minds? Because I think it, it's quite, you know, it's quite complicated. Do you think it would be possible? And are, are these policies taken by Iraq uh, would be effective? What do you think? I think that... Um... 
you know, it's a really difficult situation and children are obviously children and they certainly, you know, all children are innocent in, in regardless of the situation that they're brought up in. Um, but I think it's important, again, to go back to the root of, of being able to give children, you know, sort of the educations and opportunities that enable them to, to take positions and jobs or, or just, you know, start a farm or whatever it may be that is outside of simply joining a jihadist group. And I think, um, you know, that's, you know, when you're looking at countries that are also dealing with extreme poverty, you know, that's also something that is really hard to deal with. Um, so, you know, it, there's so many problems. And if you look at something like Iraq, um, it's not really high on their priority list to, you know, to be offering, um, you know, mass education on things. They've got security situation that, you know, every day is, is sort of unraveling. Um, and so I think that's where the international community can play you know, a much more powerful role than anything military. I mean, certainly most countries don't want to be seeing the, the American um, military footprint on their soil anymore, but that doesn't mean that we have to be completely disengaged. I think, you know, there are so many ways that we can boost, uh, you know, in humanitarian sectors and educational sectors. And I, I would like to see, you know, a much greater portion of our budget spent on initiatives like that, um, which, you know, very uh, absolutely pale in comparison to the military budget, uh, military budget. So I think that, if we can, if we learn from the lessons past, we have to sort of look at it and say, well, did you know? Did twenty years in Afghanistan? Did um, you know nine years in in Iraq? Did that really pay off? And I think that we can all pretty much collectively agree that um, you know some gains were certainly made, but um, did it do more harm than good? And and how better can that money be spent? And I think that's something that that our leaders really need to to look at. So now let's move on to, to Afghanistan. So guys, this is, to everyone listening, this is Holly McKay's book, Only Cry for the Living. You can, I'll, I'll put the link in the description if you guys want to buy it. And I, I highly recommend you do. Uh, so now Afghanistan. So you've been in Afghanistan even before the Taliban took over. Yeah, so I've been uh, several times, but I came back on this particular trip at the beginning of August, um, mm. you know, and my thought was really to document um, the American withdrawal and what was going to happen with the Afghan government after that. But uh, it certainly, you know, very much caught me by surprise in how quickly things spiraled out of control. Mm. And what are some of the most notable differences you've, you've observed so far since you've seen both faces? Right. Um, it's, it, it, there's no sort of one size fits all, so to speak. Um, mm. You know, if I was perhaps not here and all I was doing was sc scrolling through Twitter and things all day, and I would just sort of think that people were being slaughtered in the street and, and completely oppressed and, and not able to, to venture out of their houses. And certainly there are people that have this very intense fear and have gone through, um, you know, targeting. And I certainly don't want to take anything away from them. But yeah, overall, I would say Afghanistan, you know, is still functioning fairly normally, despite the terrible economic and humanitarian crisis. Um, you know, I still walk through the streets. I still wear what I always wore. I, um, you know, still go and it's sort of navigating um, a certainly a new government. But when it comes to things like targeted killings or, or people being, um, you know, hunted down, whatever, it, it, it's the exception, not the rule. And I think that there's sort of a lot of um, a lot of misinformation, a lot of sort of contagious hype um, that's sort of happening and, and it doesn't quite match the reality on the ground. Um, you know, most days are, are, are fairly peaceful. Um, you don't hear, you know, it's even it probably, you know, the security situation despite SSK is, is a lot more stable now. Um, previously, obviously the Taliban was launching a lot of attacks and. And now that they're in power, they don't have to do that anymore. So in many ways, there is a sort of a much greater degree of stability. Um, but obviously with the ISIS-K threat, that's sort of a whole other issue to be concerned with. But, mm. you know, for the most part, um, you know, I've had, you know, I'm dealing with Taliban every day. And again, there is no one size fits all. Some of them are extremely warm and respectful and friendly and others won't even sort of acknowledge me when I walk into a room. So you're certainly looking at, um, you know, very different types of people. But I also have to remember that many of them have never really interacted with a woman. A lot of them have probably only really ever known their mother and their sister and you know maybe they have a daughter and you know, lived in the mountains and and never um you know had sort of any interaction with a foreigner or a woman 
Um, so I am also mindful of that, that as much as this is a new experience for me, this is also a new experience for them. And But I do think it's really important as a woman and as a journalist to, to sort of constantly be out there, to constantly, um, you know, try to, to, you know, have them even just look at me, you know, and that's sort of one thing that I sort of see as a, as a, as a victory because I want them to learn that they need to, to learn that women are going to be around and that it's something that they're going to have to um, at some point, you know, develop a certain level of, of being comfortable with that um, rather than just sort of hiding away. And so I'm, I'm fairly sort of persistent about getting in their face wherever possible. Mm. And did, did you think the whole country would fall under the Taliban that fast? No, it certainly came as a huge surprise to me. It wasn't something that I was expecting at all. It, um, it, you know, the, sort of the dizzying speed that it happened. Um, you know, in, in the, with the benefit of hindsight, I think that we shouldn't necessarily be too surprised um, given sort of the situation that was unraveling for many, really, you could say pretty much for the entire US occupation. Um, but yeah, I certainly, um, I wasn't expecting it to happen just as fast as it could and, and for for the, the previous government to to get up and leave and without sort of a proper power sharing agreement or anything really established. I think, um, yeah, I was in Mazar when it fell and, it, you know, the, the whole situation was, you know, was it was a fearful situation because we really at that point didn't know what to expect. We didn't know how they were going to treat women, treat foreigners, treat journalists. Um, I think everybody sort of feared the worst. But um, but yeah, the sort of the, the speed of which it happened, I think, was just was terrifying. Mm. And have you met any Americans? Because, you know, as far as I know, there are still like hundreds or perhaps thousands of Americans still. Not so many, to be honest with you. There aren't really too many American journalists here. You know, perhaps a, a few that sort of had bureaus and things in the area before that. But, um, but honestly, no, I haven't. I haven't met too many Americans. I, you know, I keep reading reports of hundreds and thousands of them um, being here. I've certainly met a lot of people that have worked with the Americans and, and worked with different uh, foreign companies over the years, which is pretty much everybody because you know Afghanistan, you know, was in, in many ways an artificial economy um, where people all worked for the government or worked for um, contractors or worked for you know a foreign NGO and so when all of that was suddenly ripped away you just sort of had a, just a mass of people that were in fear and that didn't have their jobs um, but in terms of, of of American passport holders I I have not um, I have not met too many mm. and um, as a journalist you know I'm, I'm assuming at this point there, there aren't much journalists in Afghanistan currently so do you, do you go ahead? No, I said, um, yeah, there, there sort of aren't that many. It, initially, there was sort of an influx of especially European journalists, but that certainly has, has wavered. Mm. And how did they get in? Unofficially or? No, uh, you know, we get in officially. Uh, the Taliban does recognize the, the media visa that I have that was issued by the previous government and continuing to um, recognize those, those visas. They're the same visas that are still being issued. And in fact, at the foreign ministry, they're issuing the exact same visas that were always issued. So that sort of hasn't been, hasn't been changed over in any way. So um, yeah, everything's sort of like, you know, for me, um, you know, it's all legal and I have, you know, the process for journalists is you go to um, Mujahid's office and the foreign affairs office and they issue you a, a special press letter that you take with you everywhere and, and when you're going to conduct interviews or going through checkpoints wherever it may be you just sort of show the Taliban this particular letter and generally speaking they let you go so um, yeah everyone's sort of registered and it's all above board. Mm. And do, do you get turned down much like for interviews and, and such do you get turned down much or most are welcoming? First, it was actually really easy, sort of the first month you could go, you could access the interviews, it was all very um, strangely easy, you know, compared to times past when you had to go through so many different layers of people and things, um, but certainly it's become a lot, lot harder now. Um, there is a lot more turned down now, a lot of the ministries, you know, the spokespeople say nobody's speaking, even the spokesmen of the ministries say there's nobody speaking, so it is, it's becoming day by day a lot more, a lot harder to access what you need to access, and, and the Taliban are really... Um, trying to assert much greater degrees of control on everything that that we as journalists are doing so it certainly is becoming a much more difficult country to work in than it was a couple of months ago mm. and do you plan to stay to stay uh, further 
in Afghanistan? I plan to stay for another few weeks and, and probably come back to the US for a bit of a break in December because um, mm. I've been here a long time now. And yeah, and then sort of reconvene um, the beginning of 2022 and decide whether um, you know I'm going to go back to Afghanistan for a period or perhaps go to other countries. I mean, I'm certainly, you know, as somebody who's a world journalist, I'm, I'm always very interested in hotspots and, and things that are happening um, sort of up to the moment. So Afghanistan will always be somewhere that I you know, probably continue to, to visit on a daily daily basis, hopefully, but um, but there are also many countries in the world that I also feel um, that I need to give attention to as well. Mm. So what's the next move? <laughs> You can talk about. You know, that. I have to. Um, I have to configure. I have uh, a lot of different ideas in my head, and you know, I'm still very interested in the things that are happening um, in Myanmar or Burma. Um, you know, obviously things are uh, heating up a lot in Ethiopia, and um, you know, and then the Middle East. I think it's you know it has a very uh, important place in my heart that I want to continue to go back to. So, um, yeah, sort of those those areas are, are also very much on my radar, and uh, and Syria too. I think things are are quite fresh. Agile there. Mm. So we're now well past the 30 minute mark. So do you have any closing remarks we could end the episode on? Just, um, you know, I, I appreciate you having me on. I appreciate your listeners for having interest in, in the world. And, um, and yeah, please, I would love to get your feedback on my book. Um, it's really was a labor of love over many years. And I really tried to highlight some of those human stories. And for me, you know, there, there's so many things that, um, that unite us much more than they divide us. And I just hope that there's something in there that everybody can really relate to and, and to understand. And, um, and, you know, we can't be in a bubble, that things that happen in even places that seem so far away do affect our lives and decisions and the way that our tax dollars are spent. Um, so so being able to sort of stay up with that in a way that doesn't feel like it's dry, you know, news reporting, um, I think, you know, I hope that people can, can take something away from that. Definitely. Thank you, Holly, for your time. and We'll meet sometime later. Thank you. I would love that. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Thank you.